Okay. I wasn't crossing enough fingers. <laughs> hey, okay. Hey, perfect. Thank you. We meet at an ominous time. It may be a terrifying and deadly darkness that is coming. It may be a cool and refreshing darkness. Mm. A darkness that we can dream into, who can say? What we can say is that whatever is waiting for us around the corner, we are going around it, and hopefully we can go around it together, and whatever is there will have to deal with us. Mm. So in that spirit, I bring you today's talk. Um, I'll be bringing you this talk in a conversational style. It's not time for a highly formal style. I don't even know how to do receive pronunciation. Uh, uh, so, it's, you know, we'll, we'll just move on past RP. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Edwin Everhart, and my pronouns are he and him. What you see on the screen in front of you are two physical devices used to keep track of and punish children for speaking the wrong language in class. On the left is a Welsh knot, uh, which uh, was given to a child for speaking Welsh instead of English. And on the right is a child wearing a Hogan Kudan, uh, which is given to children for speaking Ryukyu and languages uh, in Okinawa and so on, uh, or uh, for northeastern dialects of Japanese in the northeast. Uh, both of these devices work the same way. So if the child uses the wrong kind of language in class, they're given the object. And then the next child who uses the wrong kind of language, it gets passed to that child. And whichever child at the end of the day still has it, receives a punishment. Um, and it might be that they have to do chores or extra homework, or they might get beaten. Um, it varies. <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking about language standardization and its opposite. Uh, we'll be talking about standard languages and um, why and how standard language, uh, language standardization comes to be in the first place. And by the way, if you want to think of this talk in terms of queerness and gender normativity, uh, go ahead and do that. I think it'll resonate quite strongly. But to start, we must ask the question, what is a language? Uh, before we move on, so I don't mean language as the apparatus of communication uh, that is ostensibly universal to all human beings, like this general language. I don't mean that. Um, nor do I mean language as in particular collections of text, um, nor do I mean language as an activity. Uh, today we are dealing with the countable noun, right? So uh, one language, two languages, 8,000 languages, 200 billion languages, um, however many counted languages. And so what is a language? People are eccentric and creative, uh, and they've been that way for a couple hundred thousand years at least. And so as a result, we have very diverse communicative resources and norms, uh, both down the block um, and around the world. And these resources and norms vary between persons, but also within persons. Um, they can be analyzed as forming patterns of similarity and dissimilarity across numerous scales. In mapping this similarity and dissimilarity across large scales, an abstract landscape of communicative diversity is conventionally broken into non-overlapping tiles. Uh, each tile is a language uh, within which communicative resources and norms are bundled together. Okay, so these items comprise a consistent inventory of sounds, a consistent inventory of words, let's say, uh, grammatical patterns, all bundled together. And the borders of the tiles are ostensibly defined as lines uh, between these bundles of communicative resources. And the, the lines are the places where the difference is so stark uh, as to prevent users of one bundle from being able to uh, communicate with users of the other bundle. Resources and norms from the near side uh, will fail to effectively create meaning on the far side. Um, they do not make sense. They are not intelligible. So this model has numerous problems. Uh, first, communicative resources and norms are not in fact bundled neatly together. Uh, they're highly variable over time and between actual people. Uh, second, actual people invariably have access to multiple pools of communicative resources and norms. Uh, so the barriers between the conventional distinct tiles are never more than an academic fiction. So we cannot say that this way of talking and that way of talking are themselves not intelligible to each other or intelligible to each other. Intelligibility needs to involve people. So we'll come back later to talk about what intelligibility is. Uh, but let's abandon that conventional paradigm and define a language in a different way. Uh, what counts as a language, 
or not is a question of power. Um, so the prolific uh, scholar Max Weinreich is today most famous for words uh, that are not his own. During a 1944 lecture series, also uh, 44 into 40, or is it 43 into 44? I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, lecture series in New York about Yiddish and Yiddishkeit. Uh, a member of the audience rejected established definitions and uh, insisted to Weinreich, you know, so the doctor, I'll tell you what a language is, and in Yiddish it says, Asprak is a dialect, mit an army on float. And you have to forgive my terrible Yiddish. Uh, but, uh, or as I might usually say it, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Um, so this is to say that the difference between what's a dialect and what's a language, the placement of hard boundaries between those categories, uh, is really uh, not subject to objectively identifiable differences in intelligibility, um, no, what's a language is not a technical question, it's a political distinction. Um, efforts to intervene in this area, armed only with technical knowledge, will fail. Um, these boundaries are subject to force and are mainly experienced as a question uh, 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 of political economy. So they reflect and support the interests of certain social actors. Right? So the claims of distinction between languages have been made under particular conditions. So at the time that Weinreich first heard his audience members say, Eschbrach is the dialect of Armin Flot, um, the Nazis were arguing that Yiddish is just a broken version of German, a worsened, corrupted version. Of, it's not its own language, it's a, a nasty, you know. And of course, Yiddish scholars would say, well, no, of course, there's a huge diversity in Yiddish language forms, documented for a very long time, it's as much a language as anything else, um, and, and, and so on. Um, so we should be aware that every single language is a contingent result of social meaning making, right? And it's also a political project supporting some interest against others. Uh, there has never been a language except as a political project, maybe on a small scale political project, but it's a political project. And there's never uh, so been a language except as a political project, and these projects have been happening for a long time. Um, so that's languages. Now we have to move to standardization. Um, the idea that some languages are better or worse than others is definitely ancient. Okay. There's, yeah, I'm not going to claim that that's fresh. Okay, <laughs> We can look to any number of sources. Uh, I'm going to cite one of my favorites. Uh, one of my favorite books, a, co uh, a collection of essays by a retired monk uh, living in Kyoto in the 14th century. Um, and uh, the text is the Tsurezeregusa of Yoshida Kenko. And I just love the Donald Keene translation. So, Kono Hijiri, Koe Uti Yugami, Ara Ara Shikte, Shogyo no Komeaka Naru Kotowari, Ito, Wakimae Zumoyato Moishini. So, in, in Keene's translation, the holy man spoke with a provincial accent. His voice was harsh, and I doubt that he had much understanding of the fine points of the sacred teachings. So, right, so we've associated nasty accent with thinking he's not good at his knowledge, you know, at his, at his expertise. Anyway, of course, there are far more ancient sources than this, but evaluation and discrimination, and I think we can say oppression based on or centered on language difference is deeply, deeply established. But standardization is a different phenomenon. Um, so following James Milroy, uh, 2001, I think of standardization as the imposition of uniformity on a class of objects. Uh, so in general terms, this includes you know, standard weights and measures, uh, standardized currency, and so on. And language standardization, uh, specifically, is the imposition of uniformity on linguistic practice. Right? So it's also an ideological system, uh, a set of beliefs and feelings that support a particular relation of power. Language standardization is a mechanism that produces class distinction, produces white supremacy, uh, symbolically elevating some people and naturalizing the exploitation of other people, right? Um, mechanically, mm -hmm. language standardization also facilitates the exercise of power over subjects of the state, um, and it also enhances the replaceability of workers. Mm. So as an ideological system, language standardization then both includes the <coughs> imposition of uniformity and the expectation of that uniformity. Uh, this is, the, in, this is the primary sense of standardization that I want to emphasize, but there are a couple of other meanings of standard which James Milroy wants us to think about, and so we're, let's, let's just talk about them very briefly. Uh, one meaning is the standard is the origin point against which all variation must be measured. So uh, 
linguistics heads, the copula, right? The copula is a grammatical tool that links ideas to get couples ideas together, right? So it's a minimal verb. So uh, somebody has a nice hat, so the hat is nice. The is is the copula. Uh, the word is doing that function. Uh, Timmy is a lot younger, right? Um, and in some kind of Englishes, it's not necessary to use copula. Um, so in, this is not something that I usually say, but you know, there are people who can, in communities, they can say, the hat nice, or a Timmy a lot younger, uh, without needing the copula, right? So if we say that certain English languages drop the copula, uh, then we are setting up some kind of Englishes as the standard, the unremarkable form from which copula has been dropped, right? Against which others must be compared. On the other hand, it would be possible to put all varieties on a more equal footing, right? So we could just describe them as being different from one another. You might say that some kinds of Englishes have copula retention and others are copula free, for example, uh, experimentally. And another meaning of standard is close to this one, namely a standard is the standard, the platonic ideal, the best form, the origin point, not only for descriptive comparison, but for evaluation, quality, and worthiness. When we think about language this way, we abdicate any control over our own languages. Right? Standard no longer, uh, the language no longer belongs to the users themselves, it belongs to whoever set the standard. Um, Shakespeare has handed us down the true and correct form of English, right? Uh, or from his heavenly seat. Or some room of quasi-state affiliated officials have decreed um, you know, what language is and we have to simply quiver and meekly obey them. Okay, so perhaps we have a hierarchically ranked series of forms of languages with the most prestigious forms toward the top. But, um, so this is related, but I primarily want to think of standardization as, again, the language ideological system which is imposing uniformity. Okay, so th these other aspects are sort of justification of that. Um, and the justification is also part of the system. So standardization is carried out directly by the state through its various institutions, education, the courts, taxation, the census, employment in the civil services, the military, the regulation of products, the regulation of media broadcasts, the regulation of media products, and so on. Standardization is also carried out by capital, right, through similar means. And it's carried out by people in general uh, who are just simply trying to survive in a world that's dominated by this ideological system. So providing inadequate interpreting services at a court or at a hospital, is this contributing to language standardization? It's forcing people into a uniform system of communication so yes, it is, right? Um, now how about this? So mocking various forms of language by copying them poorly. So when uh, white Americans attempt to use black Englishes but they get it badly wrong, but they also don't care that they got it badly wrong. Um, uh, or in, in Japanese, uh, there's a pattern of doing mock Korean by adding nida to the end of sentences that otherwise are just in Japanese. Um, uh, Jane Hill calls this mock language. Uh, we have mock Spanish up here. Um, does mock language contribute to language standardization? So in that it bolsters the superiority of the standard form uh, over other forms of language and justifies the removal of variation. Um, yes, I think, it, I think it does contribute, right? And um, grading your students' work for spelling and grammar, uh, that's standardization, right? Um, Arguing that the world should adopt English as a global lingua franca. Uh, that's standardization, uh, big time. Um, here are a couple more stories uh, of uh, language standardization playing out. First, uh, the story told by legal scholar Mari Matsuda. Uh, Rosina Lippi Green includes this in the book English with an Accent, and it's uh, the story of James Kahakua. Um, which, as not a Hawaiian language speaker, I'm not going to get great, but in, uh, here we go, in 1985, the National Weather Service advertised for a vacancy in the Honolulu Forecast Office. Coursework in meteorology and climatology and physics and mathematics, uh, as identified in the vacancy announcements uh, relevant to the position, uh, uh, was, was required as well as meteorology experience. Okay, so James Kahakua, a native Hawaiian, proudly possessed years of experience in meteorology and a Bachelor of Science degree with coursework in all the areas uh, mentioned in the announcement. 
He applied for a promotion to the open position, but was turned down in favor of a haole, of a, of a white newcomer to Hawaii. Right? A speech consultant had rated Kahakua's creole-tinged speech unacceptable for weather broadcasts. The white applicant had no college degree and minimal experience in meteorology. He was selected because of his excellent broadcasting voice. Uh, Kahakua, along with other applicants uh, who felt that the promotion of a neophyte constituted discrimination, sued the weather service and lost. Uh, Matsuda includes much more detail. Uh, this is, that was just a summary, but I won't read all, all here. Go check it out. It's an amazing piece. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I'll include this additional section So, about James Kahakua. Uh, his English was good enough to serve him in the U.S. Army for 20 years. While in the Army, Kahakua studied meteorology and served as an instructor in ballistics at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He spent several years as chief meteorological supervisor at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, uh, performing a wide range of weather observations, data collections, and predictions for the Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps. He also received a Bachelor of Science uh, degree from the University of Hawaii during this time. He was already in the employ of the Weather Service, and in that capacity, he had recorded weather broadcasts. Um, he was particularly careful in pronouncing complex Hawaiian place names. Um, and he valued his own broadcasting skills. Um, <laughs> he was also uh, proud of his experiences as a, and accomplishments as a meteorologist, and he was shocked when an inexperienced applicant who had taken only one college-level correspondence course in meteorology was selected for promotion in his stead. At no station other than Hawaii had the Weather Service used assessments of voice quality on tapes uh, to determine promotions. James Kahakua, who never had trouble making himself understood to any speaker of English, knew he was passed over because he didn't sound white. Um, he knew that that was against the law, and he decided to sue. Okay, so here's another story of standardization. I'm borrowing this from a paper that I co-authored with a former student of mine, Julia Nagai. Um, what we studied was uh, oral English proficiency testing systems for international teaching assistants. So the international student comes before they can teach a class. In, this, in these cases, they were required to take an exam uh, to see if they speak well enough to teach our, our precious white undergrads, I guess. And these are at a couple of universities in Southern California. So um, in the 1980s, the US fell into a moral panic surrounding language. Following the 1965 repeal of national origin quotas that had favored European migrants, nativist commentators uh, discussed immigrants in banal white supremacist terms as unwelcome. Uh, familiar to the current moment, of course, uh, the same thing, right? But uh, in this same period, though, uh, the movement to establish English as an official language in the United States reached its height uh, with congressional hearings in 1984 and 1988. In response to student complaints, universities uh, moved to establish new English proficiency testing regimes for international instructors, and 30 years later, oral English proficiency tests are well-established organs of U.S. university bureaucracy. There's an optional one at UMass. It's interesting that it's not required. Um, in the paper, uh, we discussed this at some length, so before going on, uh, these are not primarily tests of proficient communication. They test standardness, nativeness, speaking style, certain, I would say, non-linguistic communicative norms, such as eye contact, um, whether the TA uses the whiteboard or not, uh, things like this. Um, so tests took place in small rooms with three to four staff members, except for a few career administrators. Uh, staff were mostly part-time student workers uh, who asked questions during the uh, presentations and graded their performance. Uh, depending on the university, taking or retaking the test uh, could cost test takers an additional fee from $50 to $200. Uh, failing the test led to international students losing funding, which was tied to work as a TA. Uh, oral proficiency tests, of course, took away time that they could have spent on coursework, and, and in addition to the ESL classes they were forced to sign up for, uh, took away from time they wanted to do with research, other activities, and the effect was especially acute for students who were only at the university for a short-term program, two-year program, for example. Um, the tests also led test takers to see their own English as inadequate. So one test taker we interviewed said that uh, she always thought her English was understandable until she took the test and received a provisional pass. So you pass, but you have to take classes on things. 
Uh, she said that in the past, perhaps her interlocutors uh, couldn't make out every single word, but they were always able to communicate. Um, the test, however, took a very detailed look at every word I pronounced, she says. And until taking the test, she assumed that if conversation was flowing and people were communicating with her, that she must be intelligible. But now she says that she's unsure and often asks if her interlocutors can understand her. In addition to all of that, the test contributes to undergraduate students' belief that their international TAs and foreigners in general are not good at communicating in English unless they emulate the speech and demeanor of certain upper-class uh, white Americans. Uh, rather than learning about cross-cultural communication or the rich variation in language uh, or additional skills right, that they could have gained, undergraduates learned that they should expect foreigners to assimilate. So this is what language standardization looks like now. Right? Uh, this is relatively new. Uh, it's also new in world history. Uh, James Milroy points us to Jeremy Smith, who describes the variation in spellings in Middle English. Uh, quoting Smith, although the St. John's manuscript of Gower is undoubtedly a Herefordshire text, Hereford, Herefordshire, some, anyway, from a particular place. It's a text from a particular place. It is also true that its usage is not so grossly deviant from contemporary usages elsewhere as to make it markedly inefficient in basic communicative terms. The forms cited are individually quite widely distributed in Middle English dialects, and no experienced reader of Middle English would have had any difficulty with them. Middle English scribes could expect, when copying writing other than their own, to encounter a wide range of linguistic variation. It is clear that many of them became used to this gross range of variation in writing, including variation which allows 500 ways of spelling the item through. 500. <laughs> okay, so in, according to James Scott and Eugene Weber, right, the imposition of uniform national languages starts in the context of state administrations in the 1500s. This means court communication, taxation, and so forth. But no uniform language is being imposed uh, uh, on other written materials, in workplaces, in people's everyday lives, in any other way. Um, the imposition of national language uniformity for everyone at all times begins in the 19th century, in the mid-1800s. And the last years of that century, at, uh, even, even still fully half of the Frenchmen reaching adulthood had a la native language other than French, we are told. So, then what happened? Uh, as we would expect, language standardization started differently in different places. So um, Gellner argues that modern industry demanded that a population uh, of workers needed to be educated in standard language. Of course, Benedict Anderson uh, argues that the forms of standard language emerged through popular print media uh, and the media markets. I know the most about the case in Japan. So uh, some of my own research is there. So uh, I hope you can forgive me for par paraphrasing another one of my own chapters to tell this story. Um, the notion of a single Japanese language is a recent one. Until the 1880s in everyday life, regional linguistic differences were dramatic. Uh, prior to this time, a forest of border checkpoints between feudal domains made travel impossible for most people. And so local language forms were extremely distinctive, one valley to the next. <clears throat> the various parts of the archipelago communicated textually by means of shared writing systems like classical Chinese and orally through the work of interpreters, uh, including multiple layers of interpreters depending on the journey. Um, and uh, in other words, early modern Japan was a network of multilingual societies uh, with institutions and practices that linked many different speech communities, uh, though it was far from linguistically egalitarian, right? So any large town would have a set of upper and lower class dialects within the town. Um, while some intellectuals in Japan had dreamed of a unified national language before the 1860s, uh, noteworthy changes really began after the, during and after the turbulent years of the, the Meiji Revolution in, in 1868 to 69. Uh, so in this period of the late 19th century Japan, the state was supporting rapid capitalist development, and the adoption of Western-style state institutions. So these included the project of assembling a uniform national language uh, uh, and 
that would bear little regional character, uh, be rational and modern, and be simultaneously close to spoken language somehow. Um, so each uh, uh, element of early language policy was focused on writing. Uh, and it was only later on in about 1916, that, that, yes, that, that's the date that government policy began to require that in school, students are required to learn standard spoken language as well. So sp spoken standardization much later. Local language forms were now at that moment framed as disappearing, as vanishing, right? Um, and after 1945, language standardization was in greater force than ever before, partly because soldiers and others returned from the war, having uh, met people from different parts of, of the country, right? Having been conscripted into cross-regional units and things like this. Um, and they returned home knowing that they had an accent, which is some new information for them. Um, and post-war mobility, including for labor markets, uh, exposed many more people to that same knowledge. And young uh, labor migrants felt pressure to assimilate to their new urban surroundings. Uh, radio and television uh, enhanced the allure of national standard language, of course, uh, and provided greater access to examples of it. Um, and uh, media representations of regional dialect at this time were also mercilessly insulting and degrading, right? And uh, now I want to borrow from Tessa Carroll. Uh, dialects were characterized as slovenly bad, incorrect, and inferior. In extreme cases, sensitivity on the part of non-standard uh, dialect speakers was manifested in severe linguistic insecurity, for which Shibata Takeshi coined the term Hogen de Tokan. No, no, yeah, Hogen Komplex. I, I put it too much in Japanese. Hogen Komplex. Um, dialect inferiority complex. Um, so people from the provinces who moved to Tokyo uh, were mocked about the way they spoke, resulting in depression and, in some cases, suicide. By the 1990s, traditionally defined local language uh, was understood to be vanishing, right, even more. And I'm sure this is reminiscent for people who are uh, thinking about the way that indigenous people are supposedly always vanishing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and although it's famously vanishing, it, the, the standardization is never complete. It's, it's always an ongoing process. Um, so uh, in 2012, I spoke with the retired photographer and camera seller uh, Matsumoto Genzo of uh, Morioka. And one of the things he told me, very interesting life, this guy. He was one of the people who had returned from the war, right? So with this same experience of being told he had an accent. And he told me that his own son didn't really speak Morioka dialect, right? So I went and talked to his son. Um, and his son says, well, I might not speak it uh, like my dad, but I speak it. You know, but my son doesn't speak Morioka dialect at all. Well, he might have a little bit of an accent. So the language of the 1930s might be hard to find, but there's always a trace of local language uh, that remains, uh, right? Lo in, in the identifying of localness can always remain. So, and what's especially genius about this, okay, is that traces of accent can be invented by a listener, yeah. right? Uh, arbitrarily to match uh, assumptions about a person. So grandpa in a little rural store, he must be speaking dialect, definitely. Um, you know, the kid from the mountains, I think I hear an accent, you know. Um, the machinery of standardization can then spin up and go to work on that trace, even if it's invented, right? Uh, so the, some of the stigma and mockery then get enacted, and it's not as violent today as it was in the 1950s and 1960s, but we are all living amid this wreckage, right, of two centuries of language standardization unfolding, and the projects are still continuing. And again, it looks different in different places. So in the United States, language variation mainly gets noticed and interpreted as a sign of racial difference, right? So racial difference can cause people to perceive language variation that uh, doesn't exist. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the emergency break on that. Yes, racial difference, mm -hmm. perceived, obviously, the racial difference, right, can cause people to perceive language differences that don't exist materially. Okay, so Donald Rubin, 1992, Research in Higher Education, Volume 33, Number 4. Play an audio tape of a lecture for two rooms of American undergraduate students and show a photo of the speaker. Okay. In the first room, show a picture of a white woman. In the second room, show a picture of a Chinese woman. Okay, this, the audio is the actual same tape, the same object, the same recording. Right? 
a statistically significant difference emerges between the two rooms. Students who are shown the picture of the Chinese woman believe they're hearing an accent, okay, and perform more poorly when tested on the content of the lecture. This has been duplicated by other scholars, right? So, so racial difference can cause people to make up linguistic differences. So let him go on the emergency break. Back to language standardization in the United States. Uh, in general, it's heavily about reproducing white supremacy, right? So policing all kinds of language that aren't white enough or helping to uh, shuffle and sort and rank different kinds of whiteness in terms of their prestige. Uh, so scholars like John Baugh and colleagues have shown that uh, black sounding voices and white sounding voices get different rates of response when they call to inquire about job openings or apartment vacancies um, and so on. And most of the slang terms that authoritarian high school teachers like to ban in their classrooms are just features of black Englishes, right? And so on and so forth. And I have another story about American language standardization for you. Uh, for this one, we're going to go to the very fulcrum of the center of modern world history, Western Pennsylvania. So uh, in Pittsburgh, we have a vast number of wonderful languages, including our local kinds of Appalachian Englishes with a couple of distinct local features. And revealing all of them to you uh, uh, is, is forbidden, okay. Okay, you foreigners. Okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you the most famous one. Okay. So all you foreigners like to say an au diphthong. You can't get enough of this. Couch, trout, brown, mouse. The foreigners love that. In Pittsburgh, we can also use this debauched style, but we also have a very elegant ah monophthong that we use instead. So we can say, in, in Pittsburgh, we can say the couch, the trot, the brown color, the mouse. Oh, right. right? The mouse is under the couch, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. So despite our glittering diversity and our proud, glowing heritage, we are also subject to the hegemony of language standardization. As with Northeastern Japan, the violence toward regional dialect variation has fallen off in the last few decades, but it did not end. Um, in 2019, I was in Pittsburgh, and a couple friends told me about a class that was going to be offered at the Community College of Allegheny County, a wonderful institution. The class, How to Lose Your Pittsburgh Accent. <laughs> Just two sessions on consecutive Thursday nights, $50 to enroll, coming up in a couple of weeks. So you have no institutional affiliation. You have no IRB. You have no time to prepare. What do you do? So anyway, I'm sitting in the class, and the instructor's telling us about how uh, she used to offer this course a lot more back in the 90s. And lots of people used to enroll. It used to be packed, right? Lots of young women, white-collar professional types. Uh, here in the room in 2019, there are only about 10 of us. Uh, at one point, we go around the room to talk about why we came here, right? And here are some of the things people said. I'm teased about my accent at work. I can't lose this accent. I'm starting to think that I'm a classic person who would take your class. I'm a court reporter, not in the courthouse, but in depositions. So I'm at these local conference tables all day. When it gets heated, I'm the only neutral person in the room, so when they'll get upset sometimes, I'm really the only person who has to, like, not calm them down, but say something nice. And this Pittsburgh voice comes out, and I don't want them to think that I'm comedic relief. I'm a lawyer, maybe court reporters hate me, and I hear the words come out sometimes, and it's very Pittsburghese. I used to be a prosecutor, now I'm working for the city. When it gets heated, your accent comes out more. One time I cross-examined someone who couldn't understand anything I was saying. They're from South Africa. They had a really sophisticated accent. <laughs> uh, so these are people from Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, speaking Pittsburghese. And not in 1960, just five years ago this month. I hear the words come out. I don't want them to think I'm comedic relief. I'm teased about my accent. What is happening to these people? They're being shamed. Language standardization wants us to celebrate their shaming, right? celebrate the attacks on these folks. But really, how is this remotely acceptable? How does language standardization explain itself? I found four big strategies. So of course there are going to be more. Go find them, if you please. Uh, but consider. One, uh, standard language is supposed to be aesthetically superior to all other languages. It's more beautiful. It's cleaner. It just sounds better. 
two, standard language comes down to us from authority, uh, from the great uh, perfect founder who cannot be questioned. Don't mess with Shakespeare's precious perfect English. You've got to follow whatever the dictionary says. All right. Three, standard language creates shared political identity among all its users. Um, so if we don't have the exact same language, how can we have a deliberative democracy? And four, standard language allows for ease of communication. It's going to ensure efficiency and universal intelligibility and low friction. These are all just wrong. Okay, so standard language is more beautiful. Well, now you've made a classic error. You've made a subjective evaluation. So another person can just say the opposite. So unless you're going to get that army and navy involved to enforce your particular aesthetics, we're done here, moving on. <laughs> Standard language comes from a great authority, like Shakespeare. Factually, in terms of historical development, no, it doesn't, right? But setting that aside, are we just going to surrender our languages to some guy? You know? Are we happy to live in a subservient position like this? Get your tongue off the boot and let's move on. <laughs> Standard language makes us uh, sure that we have equal access to participate in deliberative democracy. Oh, yes. This one is pretty bad, <laughs> okay, but it has several distinct problems that are worth mentioning. So four problems, I'm afraid. So problem one, not everybody wants to be included within a particular state formation, a particular imperial formation. Sometimes we don't want to be intelligible to it. We don't want to be wrapped up in it. We don't want to be unified under a common tongue, somebody else's tongue to lick someone else's boots. Right? You know, so problem two, okay. It's true that some early advocates of language standardization were dreaming of national liberation in a popular sense and popular democracy and so on and so forth. Um, but language standardization is not uh, the only path to liberation and democracy. Um, and that's also not why standardization started happening. Right? It started to take off because both capital and the state saw standardization as being in their interest. Right? Uh, again, the economic ruling classes and the political ruling classes here are enjoying the idea that workers are more interchangeable and expendable and the state gets greater power of surveillance and control and command. Fantastic for them, right? So language standardization has started and is also still going on in states that we would never call democratic. So it's not about doing democracy. So and then problem three with this thing, I'm still on this thing. Okay, equal access, equal access, we all have equal access. This is a joke, right? So this is the same language, so everyone can access it equally, huh? So are you sure that people with paid private tutors aren't going to have a little more access? Um, you know, just like, just like the way that everyone in 15th century Scotland, for example, had equal access to Latin, or in 15th century Shanghai had equal access to, you know, the knowledge you need for the imperial civil service exam, right? So the equal access is not happening. Um, problem four, the idea that we need to use the exact same language in order to have a functional deliberative uh, process reveals an enormous sort of fear of multiplicity. Um, it's a sort of, I would argue, covert racist, uh, covert xenophobic argument. Uh, fortunately, it's also deeply wrong. Uh, we can communicate effectively despite having different and multiple linguistic resources at hand, and it, that's actually the only way that communication happens. Um, so how communication actually works, how intelligibility works, coming up in a moment, it's connected to the final thing argument in favor of standardization, which is that it's meant to bring about, bring about frictionless, smooth, efficient communication, <laughs> right? So one of the great European sickos of the last few decades is uh, Philippe van Paris, I think. Am I getting this? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, P-A-R-I-J-S, okay, Belgian guy, uh, who has argued that the world should swiftly adopt English as the global lingua franca. Right? This, is, he's, this is the big guy who's arguing this in, in 2011. Um, he wants uh, to do this because he thinks that we have to adapt to this high mobility, intense communication world. And even the critics of Van Parijs or Paris or of Philippe, let's say, I don't mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful to his name. I don't, I'm not trying to do that. I don't like the guy, but I'm not trying to do that crass. You know what, you know what I mean? Like, right. I can respect his name, you know what I'm saying? Maybe we'll get along in a, in a future life, you know? Um, anyway, even his critics in political philosophy have basically agreed with his framing. Okay, linguistic diversity is, they, this is the shooter in Robichaud, uh, uh, linguistic diversity is, we must face it, 
a formidable, formidable obstacle to mutual understanding. More diversity means less speech partners and more difficulty to access information. Okay, so how tragic then, you know, that any information should be off limits to capital and empire. Uh, what if we challenge the assumptions of this framework instead? I want to suggest um, that, you know, instead of accepting the idea that we're going to adapt to a high mobility, intense communication world, we could think of other ways to organize the world. Not high mobility, but free mobility. All right? Not intense communication, but perhaps deep communication. To make that world, what kind of linguistic practices do we need? Or language politics, or language research priorities, perhaps. So it's time to move toward the opposite of language standardization. So language standardization promises to do away with all the friction. Right? So we need to standardize in order to be intelligible. How can we possibly understand each other if we don't use the same language? Uh, some fields uh, use the term intelligibility as a measure of how much content is successfully conveyed in a particular utterance. You can record a tape of a person talking, play it for certain listeners, and rate the intelligibility as a percentage. Okay, so presumably if we're using the same language, we should have a very high rate of intelligibility, and we expect that that rate will go down as languages that are more and more different from each other. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Well, how about, how about this as a, as a thing to chew on? This is a still from a video by Chuck Goodwin, the linguist and scholar of interaction. Um, in the circle is Chuck's father, Chill, Late in life, uh, Chill lost the ability to speak except for about three words. He could understand what others said, but in a very important way, he no longer shared the same language as his interlocutors. And yet Chill managed to communicate very effectively. As Chuck wrote in uh, his famous 2004 article on this, a man with a three-word vocabulary is able to invoke and elicit a complex story about events that happened almost a half century earlier. So something else is happening here. So like I said back at the beginning, intelligibility needs to involve people. Right? We need a concept of intelligibility. And if you want to call it something else because intelligibility already has it, okay, we can. But I'm going to say that for now. Mm -hmm. No, you know. <laughs> um, but we need a concept of intelligibility that's not based on simply sharing the same language. Uh, it's called something else if you want, but... Um, but I want to refer to the social, interactional, intersubjective state in which people are effectively communicating. To achieve this state, we need three ingredients. First, we need to know what to do if communication breaks down. Okay, so are we shocked and giving up? Are we unsurprised and we're using some strategies that we know to deploy? Um, some of those strategies might be repetition, using alternative phrasing, switching to a different modality of communication, um, asking others for help, and other techniques, right? So familiarity, fami that, ooh, some interesting intonation happening. Familiarity with miscommunication and strategies for resolving it um, is, is what this piece is, right? So if we, if we didn't live in a world that was dominated by standard language ideology, we, it would be hard to notice this, right? We, we can only notice the lack of this piece um, if you have people who are assuming that all language is going to be the same, and they're assuming that no breakdown will ever happen. But you, you do notice sometimes that people are sh shocked by miscommunication. <laughs> um, okay, second, we need desire and effort. Okay, that's the... Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we need to want to communicate. We need to put in the effort. You don't know the languages around here, but you badly need to find a toilet. Okay, so you're going to put in some work. Uh, Rosina Lippi-Green talks about this as the communicative burden, um, that all parties in communication need to exert some effort, um, both to create utterances and to interpret them. And sometimes people are willing to contribute uh, their part in carrying the communicative burden, and sometimes they shirk that burden. Uh, David Graeber describes pretty much the exact same phenomenon as interpretive labor, um, uh, pointing out that uh, those who have power are able to skip doing interpretive labor. Right? So instead of thinking carefully about someone else's meanings and intentions, you can just point a gun at them and force them to do the interpreting. 
you know, force them to say things in a way that's clear and easy for you. Uh, again, skipping the interpretive labor or shirking the communicative burden. So depending on our attitudes toward our interlocutors, uh, depending on our political stance toward them, uh, depending on our power relationship with them, we may engage in that labor or we may skip it. Um, for this reason, there are, of course, communities who share 95% plus of the same lexicon, um, and, but they, you know, they can't understand each other. You know, uh, of course, uh, a couple of indigenous uh, populations in Northern California, famously this way, and you know, think of other very closely related national languages. It's a different, it's a different country, so we're not doing it. And then, of course, you know, indiv on individual level, you know, when my wife is yelling at me, I can't understand what she's saying, you know, kind of thing. So lack of desire, lack of effort, lack of doing interpretive labor, intelligibility is going to break down as the intersubjective state. So third, we need shared semiotic resources. So common resources for meaning making. Shared resources uh, of language is part of this. So we, we, you know, having some of the same sounds and words uh, and grammatical structures is very helpful and it's central perhaps. But semiotic resources also includes cultural norms and references. We both think a handshake means the same thing and should happen at the same time. We both agree about what side of the road to drive on. Um, and it includes anything else that exists in the shared semiotic field. Um, so if we are in the same room together, we can refer to our physical surroundings. Um, and we, we all know what's being referenced over that way, over that way. So all of this is our pool of shared communicative resources. Um, if we have no semiotic resources in common, of course, intelligibility is going to break down. So language standardization ideology would have us think that shared linguistic resources is the most or the only important ingredient here, um, or the only ingredient that we can do anything about. Right? Um, but we can do things about our skills around miscommunication, and uh, we can do things about uh, the balance of power and the attitudes people have toward each other. We can intervene there. Uh, all three ingredients are important. If we have a desire to communicate and lots of shared semiotic resources, you know, we can make things work even if we don't really know what to do when a problem arises. Hopefully we'll make things work. If we know how to resolve miscommunication and a lot of, and we have a lot of shared uh, semiotic resources, you can make things work even if you hate this person. Um, <laughs> if we have a great desire to communicate and we are prepared to improvise some solutions, we know what to do with breakdowns, we can do a lot with very little in the way of shared semiotic resources. And one of the things you'll do is start creating some. Um, so uh, we typically need all three ingredients in some kind of balance, though. And so intelligibility can't be achieved by simply imposing uniformity on linguistic practice. Right? We achieve it by learning more kinds of language, by paying attention to each other, by doing interpretive labor. right? And we can dismantle the whole apparatus of language standardization and still be fine. The apparatus is doing a lot of harm and supporting some unsavory interests, so we should dismantle it. Uh, is anyone working on that? There are a couple of intellectual and political tendencies that are worth mentioning in this territory. They're, they're all essentially projects seeking reform and redress within the logic of state institutions, but they're worth mentioning. Um, so, water time. We're like, we're cooking. Hopefully we're, hopefully we're going fast enough. Um, there's a discourse of language rights or linguistic human rights. Um, focuses on the rights of communities to use their languages, especially pertaining to minority languages, indigenous languages, and so on. It involves uh, some, there's some discourse about individual persons' rights to use language. Um, and uh, there's also a body of work in political philosophy, uh, calling itself linguistic justice. And these schools of thought essentially are concerned with uh, what the state should do about minority minority languages, right? What the state policy should be toward a minority, minority language. Now, in North American linguistic anthropology, we have an emergent school of thought on language and social justice. And the scholarship in this field has a coherent set of themes. It has a coherent and large and growing body of literature. It has a coherent set of specific tactics and genres of work associated with particular audiences and collaborators. Um, and uh, I could tell you, well, I'll give you some examples, but it's, it's lacking a little bit of coherence in theory, okay? 
Uh, so, I mean, they, some of the typical stuff is to you know, combat uh, racist folk theories of what language is, uh, or to combat pseudo-scientific pseudo theories of how children acquire language. Um, but theoretically, we've you know this area has been a driving force in linguistic anthropology, and it's been using the sort of conventional tools of linguistic anthropology. Um, but uh, I sense that we've been playing whack-a-mole. Okay, we have a new issue arise. Bam. Okay, we have another issue. Bam. Bam. Okay, we, we're 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 a little lost in terms of having a a central thing to do. We need a more coherent sense of what we're fighting or what we're fighting for, where we're trying to go. And uh, we already have a sense of that. It's kind of in the subconscious, in the dreams of uh, of the of the writers here. So in in um, in the most recent edition of English with an accent. Um, there's a there's a wish at the end that that readers will unlearn standard language ideology. Mm. We keep saying it indirectly or backward, right? I think we have a lot to gain by adopting a new direct framing and taking a head-on orientation to what we're doing. Um, we need an intellectual and a political program that's the opposite of language standardization, not centered on capitalist efficiency and state authority, but centered on love and forgiveness. I call it Langy Wangy. Uh, you can call it something else if you want. But Langy Wangy is a language ideological system of beliefs and feelings and practices, and I want to outline the beliefs and feelings first. Uh, Langy Wangy ac emphasizes accessibility, multiplicity, and play. Um, and Langy Wangy also enshrines two specific kinds of freedom. The first freedom of Langiwangi is the freedom to be understood. Uh, like the freedom to move to a different place or the freedom to learn, this requires active provision of some resources. So to enact Langiwangi, we have to actively share interpretive labor. We have to uh, share the communicative burden, ensure that that access is maintained at the highest level. So the first freedom is the freedom to be understood. The second freedom of Langiwangi is the freedom to not be understood. So this means freedom to play, to use the languages of your community, languages of your choice. To enact this freedom, we have to expect communicative friction. We have to welcome differences. So Langi Wangi is aligned with a broader transition, or no, what am I saying? Transformation, yeah, transformation of our social lives. The fear of miscommunication, the fear of communicative friction reveals the pressure that we're under at all times. Right, so we, we do actually live, unfortunately, in a high mobility, uh, intense communication world. But you know, imagine if we weren't rushed so badly all the damn time. I mean, people like to learn a new thing. It's like a little puzzle game. When, you know, we can't think about doing this, this world, you know? So on the one hand, Langi Wangi is a future language ideological system, right, that we will create. On another hand, Langi Wangi is the intellectual and political activities that we have to undertake to bring ourselves toward that future. And on a third hand, uh, something like it that's not really new has been happening this whole time. So as James Milroy tells us, most language systems that exist now and have ever existed have been unstandardized. I want to show you a quite interesting example from uh, the ethnographic work of George Grace uh, in uh, studying language practices in New Caledonia. I'm just going to quote from Grace for a short moment here. So one of the things, I, he says, one of the things I found puzzling was that in some areas the people seem to have no conception of what their language is and no sense of belonging to a linguistic community. And he means in the standardized sense, right? He goes on, he says, Most individuals have been exposed from infancy to a variety of different languages. It seems that people have always recognized a particular language as being, in some official sense, their own, However, there are reports of children beginning to learn the foreign tongue of their mothers before their own official one. There have occasionally been instances in which a village has switched its linguistic affiliation from one language to another. In the situation which I've described, we may imagine that each individual conceives of the immediate linguistic reality in terms of pools of linguistic resources. Translating from one New Caledonian language to another was radically different from translating between a New Caledonian language and French. Translation equivalents in New Caledonian languages generally correspond to identical representations, 
in the mind of speakers and appear to the latter simultaneously as translations and as synonyms. So note the common practice of drawing on this synonymy in songs and oratory by repeating the same word in two or three different languages. These conditions potentially explain, uh, it's slightly technical, but the unexpectedly low cognate percentages between languages, the complicated sound correspondences, and the large phoneme inventories of New Caledonian languages. And as for that low rates of cognates, um, there is evidence of rapid vocabulary replacement, which suggests a lot of innovation and playing with language. And then he goes on, in addition, there are reports from New Caledonia as well as from other parts of Melanesia of people using words from languages other than their own and of indiv individuals being unable to say which word properly belongs to their language and which do not. My intention with citing this description of New Caledonian practices is not to suggest that it is necessarily langiwangi um, or that it should be copied exactly. The point is that language practices have differed an enormous amount. Uh, and practices very different from standardization have existed, currently exist, and are possible for us to build toward together. Um, so when you use your own techniques to handle miscommunication, that's langi wangi. Uh, when someone needs an interpreter, or we uh, offer interpretations for each other in the spirit of mutual aid, that's langi wangi. Uh, language revitalization programs that are finding a way to flourish without uh, standardization, that's langi wangi. Uh, when you refuse to grade for spelling and grammar in your class, that's langi wangi. Um, a very dear friend of mine as a child had this wonderful characteristic in his speech uh, where other bozos like myself would say uh, cha. Uh, he would say ta. So he had a lateral affricate uh, instead of the boring old palatal affricate. Um, so I might, for example, say we have cheese and chips. And he had this wonderful way of saying we have cheese and chips. Um, I love that guy. You know, But during grade school years, he had to go to therapy to change the way he talked. Right, He had to go through this humiliating process to make him talk the same way that I usually do. Mm -hmm. If we achieve langi wangi, we're not going to do that to kids anymore, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, my friend is not going to have to be humiliated for having this slightly different sound. And instead, we get to enjoy his particular style. He gets to, or he can change it if he wishes to, right? He can also have this freedom. But, um, but he, gets, he gets the option of having this distinctive feature about himself. So how do we work toward langi wangi? Well, <coughs> I'm going to go back to Japan here. So for a roughly 20-year period between 1985 and 2005, there was the dialect boom in Japan, Hogen um, Boom. And people were doing poetry in dialect, uh, writing stories, memoirs, novels. Uh, small towns started to promote their dialect as a tourist attraction, so you'd see it on kind of tourist goods, and souvenir towels and stickers and postcards and all the rest. In a small city in Iwate Prefecture, Ohunato, uh, a couple of very interesting guys got together and started a dialect theater company. Um, they wrote original plays, and, and that ran for a number of years with audiences in the thousands. Um, by the way, uh, the author of those plays is Dr. Yamaura Harutsugu. Uh, he's a larger-than-life character. He's part of the small minority of Catholics in Japan. Uh, and Dr. Yamaura has an interpretation of the biblical story of the Tower of Babel that I just have to... I just have to bring you, I know this is so super long, but um, conventionally, right, there's the city uh, where all the people have a single language and they're sort of very boastfully and pridefully building this tower to reach heaven, to attack and dethrone God. Okay, so God curses them by confusing their languages and making it impossible for them to communicate. But Yam Yamaura says, no, the original version must have been different than this, right? The, the, uh, those ancient people were wiser than that. So, he, so his interpretation is that Anywhere that people have one way of talking, one way of thinking, they're in enormous suffering. Uh, he, he says, think of contemporary North Korea. Think of the United States during the Red Scare or some of these other moments, right? Um, he says, so, so God saw that the people of Babel were in pain, and he blessed them with many different ways of speaking and thinking so that they would no longer be forced to build a big stupid tower. <laughs> Okay, so at the same time that Yamagura and his friends were running this dialect theater on the other coast, on the Japan Sea coast, uh, there's a, a village uh, in Yamagata Prefecture, Mikawa, 
And in Mikawa, there's a group of ambitious young folks. They're all sort of staff for the city government, for the town government. Um, and uh, they organized what they called Zenkoku Hogan Taikai, so the national or all country, the national dialect convention or national dialect uh, conference. Um, and that ran for over 15 years, uh, featuring singers and poets and performers and also sociolinguists uh, coming in to give academic talks. Um, all people from all up and down the archipelago, um, they had Ainu language activists, so indigenous language activists. They had Ryukyuan language activists um, as well. And they were really just trying to support, the, I mean, part of what they were doing is trying to support the village economy by creating a tourist attraction. But um, they also hinted at this sort of vision of solidarity across all kinds of language, right? Solidarity in the face of language standardization. So now costume change. <laughs> okay. So the kind of solidarity is exactly what we need now. And I hope we can build that solidarity if we see language standardization as a problem that we all share. So after I took that class at the Community College of Allegheny County, How to Lose Your Pittsburgh Accent, I had to do something. And uh, I heard about the adult education program at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, targeted retirees, so you, you have to be 50 or better to enroll. Uh -huh. Very lovely. So I came up with this course proposal, Pittsburghese and Accent Appreciation. Nice. <laughs> so the course runs once a week, five meetings. So we did Pittsburghese, language standardization, how we can appreciate language variation. I had a wonderful and strange time with those aunts and uncles uh, in that room. Um, we, uh, we did a little intro linguistics, intro sociolinguistics, mm. intro hi history of Pittsburghese. We did a discussion of some of the other big languages in the area, especially black languages, you know, black Englishes, black Pittsburghese. Uh, and we talked, uh, we practiced how to understand different accents, a little bit of ear training. Um, that's a lovely time. What else can we do? What else can we well, We can enact the freedom to not be understood. So go ahead and be unintelligible and inscrutable, right? You know, have a time. Um, as James Scott tells us, illegibility has been and remains a reliable resource for political autonomy. So go out there, write macaronic poetry. <laughs> you know, make up new words and phrases and sound patterns. Play with language. Why, why do we always have to say fingers crossed? We could say fingles crossed or fingos crossed. But, you know, just, just go for it, you know. And second, we can enact the freedom uh, to be understood. So this one takes, uh, requires us to take up the communicative burden, uh, to take on interpretive labor, but I don't think this labor is drudgery. Uh, it's, a, it's also a kind of play. Um, as Bell Hooks has said, we should think of the moment uh, of not understanding what someone says as a space to learn. So to enact the freedom to be understood, we can give people the benefit of the doubt, we can give people a little more time, uh, we can make an explanatory diagram, uh, we can work really hard to pronounce people's names uh, the way they like to say it. Um, we can not learn just one language system at once, but learn several language systems that are overlapping. Uh, right? In, in the new language class, learn what uh, the different uh, styles are. Um, Graeber and Wengro in 2021, they talk about the systems in pre-colonial Australia and North America uh, that gave people freedom of movement. Um, a person could travel for months across the whole continent, um, but still, wherever you arrive, somebody will be obligated to house you and feed you and treat you as part of the family. This is a moiety system usually, but you know, treat you as a as a as a member of the family. And this made this is made possible by certain norms, norms of hospitality and asylum and civility and shelter. So the freedom. To be understood is also something we can create by building up similar norms. Um, and Languangi as an intellectual program, as a research paradigm, I don't know where you should go, but I think going back and reading James Milroy on language standardization is a good start. And we can excise the tendency to compare, uh, to default to comparing with the standard languages. And we can also never write in a way that treats uniformity as normal. Um, and we can write in a way that expects 
and maybe uses play and multiplicity. Um, we can think of languages as plural by default. Um, we can think of languages as ideologically constructed registers and entities. Um, and we can find ourselves encountering new research questions. How have people uh, resisted standardization? How have people lived outside of it? What has occurred and what's possible? How can language standardization be brought to an end? And when can we say goodbye to receive pronunciation and all the other flavors of standard language? And so, now, I bring you the last item, which is... Goodbye, RP. Let our words go free. Flat your vows. Goodbye, RP. Tug on, cross your teeth. Slag and slur, bar and burn.